Okay. Thank, thank you very much for that introduction and, and thank you for the, the invitation to, to speak today. So uh, before I start, just a, a few uh, headlines about CWCT together with my contact details. I'll, I'll talk more about CWCT in a moment and you know, kind of what, why we exist and, and what we do. But before I do that, I thought it would be just interesting. Who, who in the audience has heard of CWCT? Three, four, five, excellent. Oh, I can make anything up. You wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. Um, do, do any, who, who knows what we do of, of those people who've heard of us? What, do you know what we do? Not so much. Okay. Good. Okay, well, ho hopefully, um, by the end of the next uh, 20 minutes, you will know uh, an awful lot more of uh, wh why we exist and, and the work that we do to try and uh, uh, improve the, the cladding industry. So, this is what I intend to talk about today, and I suppose the first thing to apologise for, or maybe it's a good thing, I'm not really going to talk about GRC. You're going to hear an awful lot about GRC over the next couple of days, so, so maybe this will be a, a refreshing break for you. Um, instead, I am going to talk about... Um, I'll, I'll split my presentation to, to three topics. So what I sort of consider common challenges for the facade and, and the cladding industry, uh, and that leads into to why CWCT came into existence, and then uh, talk about some of the, the activities we do, the publications we have, uh, in order to, to improve the industry. So that is, uh, that's the plan for the next 20 minutes or so. So, um, in no kind of particular order, we consider the, the topics I've got on the screen there to be some of the most significant issues facing the, the facade, facing the cladding industry today. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about these particular topics over the next four or five slides. It was uh, interesting looking at the, the programme for the event, you know, but a number of these issues are being discussed, particularly uh, later on this afternoon, so clearly these are key considerations for, uh, for all of us. So, starting with cladding performance. What do cladding systems have to do? What performances need to be considered? There are obviously numerous uh, structural, thermal weather tightness, impact, uh, movement accommodation. But what does that mean for, for the cladding itself? How will our cladding systems perform? How do we assess uh, satisfactory performance? This may be a, uh, a particular uh, challenge for a cladding system that may comprise components from multiple different suppliers. You may be supplying the cladding panels Others will be supplying the support system, uh, insulation, membranes, cavity barriers, uh, the back wall assembly and so on. How does that all come together? How can that, uh, what, what can be assessed by calculation? What testing is required? What scale of testing is required? And again, it's, it's difficult when you are only uh, a, a, an important but only a, a part of that whole system. I've singled out fire as a, a specific performance requirement, um, for obvious reasons, really. It, no, it remains a, a key consideration post-Grenfell, and no, the situation is still somewhat um, uncertain. Now, you're likely to be most concerned about the reaction to fire of your cladding panels. That now includes uh, limitations on smoke and burning droplets for the first time, in, in the UK at least, which may introduce uh, additional challenges. However, again, I think it's important to highlight that it's, it's the performance of the whole system rather than the individual components which is, which is important. An unsafe system can be constructed from materials that are all non-combustible. Therefore, we need to consider things like cavity barriers, how and where are they going to be installed? How are they going to interact with your cladding panels, particularly if they have voids and, and, and ribs and, and other things on the back of them? How do we ensure that a cavity bar an open state cavity barrier is going to expand to, to fill that void in the event of a fire? So again, coordination is required uh, between different members of the design team and, and different suppliers and so on. And again, how do we, how do we demonstrate adequate fire performance? How are assessments made when the, the proposed design differs from what has been previously tested? 
Over the past few years, uh, the importance of sustainability has uh, dramatically increased and is now probably one of the top considerations in the selection of any facade system. We not only need to think about the performance, again, of, of individual materials and products, but also how they affect, uh, the effect they have in relation to the whole, carbon, um, the whole life carbon of the building. Now, what influence will the cladding have on the, on the building services, um, on the, the building structure, for example? What happens to our materials, products and systems at the end of their useful life on a building? Can they be recovered uh, and reused? How might ideas around the circular economy uh, influence the design of systems and the materials used within them? How, how does that affect GRC? How can, how can we maximise the potential uh, value of the product after its first use and then try and you know, maintain that value in future uses? Now, these ideas are you know, really um, becoming far more significant and you know, there is a, a definite need to, to respond to those questions. Arguably, I've saved the biggest challenge until last, competence. The Building Safety Act in the UK introduces new uh, competence requirements for all those involved in con the construction industry. Crucially, there are requirements that apply to all building projects, not just those higher risk projects, as, as some people uh, wrongly think. And these comp competencies need to be demonstrated. It's no good just saying you are competent. How do you prove it? Um, it the Building Safety Act is very, very complicated. There's a link there. If you follow that, that links to a, a, a SIBSI web page, which is a really good summary for anybody who wants a, a relatively uh, good, easy summary of something that is very complicated. So I recommend you having a look at that. Hopefully, um, that sort of helps set the scene. I'm now going to introduce CWCT uh, in a bit more detail and then discuss how uh, we have and how we are trying to you know, address some of the challenges that I've identified. Clearly, uh, a number of the, the issues I've spoken about aren't new. Now, facades have historically performed badly. They've leaked air and water and failed prematurely. By the, the late uh, 1980s, you know, certain clients were understandably getting quite frustrated uh, by that. At a similar time, there was a, a government report into the UK construction industry. Its, uh, its findings were not positive, let, let's put it like that, uh, and it highlighted the, the facade as a, as a particular area of concern. And the report concluded that a, a lack of standards, training, research and investment were all significant contributing factors to this poor performance. They're things that we may perhaps can all recognise. Following um, that report, it was, it was decided that something needed to be done uh, to try and address some of the issues raised. Now, clearly the facade, the, the cladding is absolutely vital in terms of the overall performance of our building. It controls heat loss uh, or, and heat gain air tightness, um, water leakage, as well as you know, clearly governing the appearance of the building. It may also represent 20 to 30% of the total building cost. So a, a big issue. And, and the centre was uh, subsequently established kind of jointly uh, between industry and the University of Bath. Ted Happold of Bureau Happold um, was a professor at the university at the time, and that's the simple reason why we ended up in Bath, because that's where his office was, and you know, we, we, uh, we uh, ended up in the same place. And our roles uh, are broadly listed here. And a, a couple of years ago, we celebrated our 30th uh, anniversary, so I won't say we've solved all of the problems, but no, clearly we're, we're doing something right. Um, we've recently uh, updated our, our mission statement, and there's a load more information on our, on our website there. It's, it's not a, uh, a radical change from our previous statement, and it's deliberately very simple. 
to continue to improve the quality of the building envelope. We've done loads over the, uh, over the years to improve the facade industry. We've carried out lots of research, we've produced technical guidance, we've worked with standards committees, uh, training, including establishing an MSC course, twice as it happens, um, dissemination through events uh, and conferences, helping to establish the Society of Facade Engineering, um, collaboration with other industry bodies, and so on. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of those uh, activities shortly. We obviously need to continue doing that whilst recognising the, uh, the changes in particular that have happened post-Grenfell and other changes that will be coming our way in the future. And as I mentioned on a, a couple of slides previously, competence and competency are you know, really the, the key words uh, of the moment. So, just very, very briefly, um, organisation. So, we don't just operate in our own little, little bubble in Bath. We have a, a board made up of, of company directors and sponsors who help um, provide advice and guidance and help to determine our uh, strategic approach. As with other uh, organisations, we have a, a very active uh, technical committee who uh, routinely give us a hard time. Um, and we meet two to three times a year. And... That technical committee represents the, the diversity of our, our membership as a whole, as I'll, I'll illustrate on the next slide, and that helps to ensure that the guidance we, we produce is, we hope, sensible and, and, and balanced. And that technical committee is involved in and approves everything we publish. And again, I think that's a big part of our success, um, and it, it gives us you know, added authority. You know, what we publish is not just our view, it's, it's that of many experienced and, uh, and knowledgeable people. And one thing that, uh, that surprises many, or no, maybe not, not you, is no, our size. No, we are small. No, we have four technical staff, um, although we are trying to recruit at the moment, so if anybody's interested, no, please, uh, please let me know. But despite that small size... Um, as illustrated here, now our, our reach is quite wide. Our membership you know, gradually uh, increased uh, over the years as, as more uh, companies kind of brought into to what we were trying to achieve, um, and that an increase in membership has accelerated uh, in recent years. We currently have around 350 uh, member companies and, uh, and receive uh, applications most weeks, now, even in, in these slightly challenging times. And that level of membership is obviously... Uh, very encouraging and um, I think demonstrates the important role that we have within uh, the industry. As, as shown here, and actually this is a slightly, uh, a slightly old uh, uh, map, our, our membership is, is truly international uh, with member, member companies in, I think, 20, at the last count, 25 countries excluding the UK. And crucially also, as you can see from the, the, uh, the, the pie chart on the left there, now, our membership is, is varied. Now, we don't just represent a, a single sector of the industry. Now, our membership covers you know, all those uh, with an interest in the facade, from clients uh, and architects to consultants, contractors, manufacturers and suppliers, and you know, anyone else with an interest, you know, research bodies, test houses, uh, trade associations and so on. And again, I think that's one of the reasons for, uh, for our, our success and why our guidance is, is generally well-received wouldn't go as far as saying our guidance is always universally liked, but it's, it's generally accepted, um, particularly after a period of time. So that's why we were formed. Um, what, what have we done uh, over the last 30 years or so, and what, what do we continue to do? So um, that kind of role has obviously changed over time. But when we first started back in the, the late 80s, Actually, one of the first jobs was actually was trying to understand what the problems were. You know, what was holding the industry back? And they, uh, that included not only technical um, challenges, but also procurement issues. Now, one reason for poor facade performance was due to uh, inconsistent specifications and a lack of skilled people involved in the, the design, management and, uh, and construction process. So there were kind of long-standing issues that needed addressing. In addition to that, we were facing an industry that was, that was changing. It was changing in terms of the materials that were being used. 
uh, facades were, were getting more complex, and as we've seen some examples today. Um, and some of the performance characteristics that were being expected were, um, were also becoming more onerous. Now, you put those things together, and it's, it's a recipe for disaster. So clearly, you know, something needed to change. So we've continually carried out research and guidance and, and published documents in order to try and address some of those issues. Our current standard um, is on the slide there, our standard for systemized building envelopes. And now this provides a, a consistent way of specifying cladding and curtain walling and test methods in order to verify the performance. And those test methods went on to, to form the basis of, of many uh, European standards. In addition to establishing performance requirements, the standard also provides further guidance and commentary on what level of performance is appropriate. So it gives further guidance to the specifier. Uh, it also sets out requirements for large-scale testing of, of weather tightness um, in order to demonstrate performance. Again, this has been widely accepted, and we've sold standards to companies all, all over the world. Now, any of you who are in the business of, of providing cladding panels for, for rain screen systems, for example, now you, you may well have had your have been involved in testing or, or had your products tested uh, as part of, uh, of, of this standard, not just in the UK, but as I said, all, uh, all over the world. Closer to home, this also forms the basis of the, the MBS specification and, uh, and the NHBC standard. I've got no idea how I'm doing for time, so if I'm overrunning, please tell me, because I haven't been paying attention. Thanks. Um, a, a lot of our early work focused on, on curtain walling. Um, I guess more, more relevance here. It, it, it was going quite quickly recognised that further guidance on, on built-up walls uh, was needed in order to, to supplement that guidance. Uh, built-up walls are pretty simple things, really, but they go wrong. The main issue probably with built-up walls, is really the way in which they're packaged. One contractor might be doing the stud work, uh, another the dry lining, someone else fitting the insulation, another fitting the rain screen, the panels coming from someone else, and someone else fitting the windows. How is that managed? Who has overall design responsibility for the built-up wall? Who specifies the performance of the individual um, layers? And then you know, what about interfaces? Now, if your GRC panels are being used in a rain screen system, now what information do you need to provide? Now, how do your products influence the, the overall performance of the system? So this document aimed to, to provide some much needed uh, further detail um, around some of those issues. As you might imagine, uh, fire has taken up quite a lot of my time over the last four years. And, and I'm sure you're aware, you know, fire continues to be a, a huge issue in terms of uh, regulatory requirements and, and safety of, of existing buildings in particular. So here are the, a few of the, the key activities we've been involved in recently. We've engaged with government and many other organisations to try and sort of inform the debate and, and positively influence future guidance. That is very challenging, um, and it, it always takes a lot longer than, than you would hope, but you know, it's, it's a, a key part of this process. We're involved in steering groups for a number of uh, different research product, projects that intend to provide uh, data to inform future changes, and one of those is looking at large-scale testing of cladding systems. BS8414, uh, a test widely used in the, in the UK to test fire performance of cladding systems has been quite widely criticised um, since Grenfell and uh, this is a, a project looking at other types of large scale uh, fire testing and again that is something that you, know, you will have to uh, be aware of when the results of that uh, research project are, are published and, and subsequently go on to, to influence future guidance and, and future regulations. We've also been involved in, in some standards, including writing a new PAS, PAS 9980, on appraising the fire performance of facades of existing buildings. Again, we've, we've collaborated with others, in particular the Society of Facade Engineering, to publish a, a guidance document following the, the so-called ban on combustible materials um, back in late 2018, 
Issue two of that document is uh, currently in the final stages of, of preparation and will be freely available to, to download hopefully very soon. And then no, we're also uh, currently in the process of updating our uh, other fire guidance contained within, within our standards and technical notes. And as I said, it is a really difficult and frustrating process because the simple fact is that the, the guidance, the official guidance and regulations are complex. They are at times ambiguous and sometimes illogical and people are looking at you to provide guidance and you, know, you need to make sure you, the guidance you are providing is is sensible and appropriate. So trying to engage with government on these things is, yeah, is, is a challenge, but uh, one that we have to, have to step up to. 18 months ago, uh, we didn't have any information on facade sustainability. But uh, since we started our work, we have made, I think, fantastic progress, and, and I'm, I'm really very proud of that. We published our first document, uh, which was a sustainability primer back in October 2021. Since then, we've published uh, nine further papers. We've had uh, three articles published in journals, and we formed uh, a number of work streams to focus on more in-depth guidance that we identified during the research of our first uh, paper. The result of the first work stream, um, is that going to work? There we go, yep, yeah, uh, has already been published. So at our AGM last year, we launched our methodology for calculating the embodied carbon of facade systems. And we think this is a, a really important document. With emphasis in recent decades on uh, reducing operational carbon emissions from buildings, embodied carbon is obviously becoming more significant. And there is an increasing shift in focus towards embodied carbon assessment. So that now requires much more detailed uh, quantification in order to better understand the emissions uh, and how they can be most effectively reduced. This is clearly key uh, as, uh, as we move towards uh, net zero buildings, whatever that means, because it hasn't quite been defined yet. So with no agreed uh, specific guidance for facades, we, you know, we quickly identified this as a, a consistent methodology uh, as, a, as vital. If we wanted to, to better understand the contribution our facade systems make, be able to compare, reliably compare different options, um, quantify improvements and set targets and so on. And of course there is, there is more to come. As you know, sustainability is a huge topic. There is a, a focus on, on carbon, but it's much wider than that. And the more you look at it, the more complex it becomes. Uh, so, yeah, uh, watch this space. We will be producing much more guidance in the future. And it is really absolutely crucial. We couldn't have done this on our own. And we worked quite differently with this uh, sustainability work. And the support we've received from all those involved, their, the commitment, the, the passion, the, the knowledge has been uh, fantastic and a, a, real, a real inspiration. We have over 75 people, all volunteering, uh, involved in, in this work. And as I say, it's, yeah, it's, it's very different to how we normally do things. That collaboration uh, obviously has its own challenges, um, but overall I think the results are, are fantastic and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the, the discussion on sustainability uh, later on this afternoon. Now, understanding the, the sustainability of your, your products is, you know, frankly, vital if they are to, to have a future. On to uh, competence and training is clearly a big part of what we do uh, and we've done various things over years, uh, installer training, online courses. Uh, we've established a, a master's course in facade engineering, which is now at the University of the West of England. And both uh, Ian and, and Richard have both given presentations in, in recent years. So we're, we're trying to get the, the message of, of GRC across to our, to our students. And you know, through our online courses and our, our short courses in particular, you know, we've, we've trained thousands of people over the years. Now, training like this is, is vital to help 
ensure those involved in the, the design of cladding systems have the required knowledge and skills. We're currently involved in something, again, this is, this is very UK focused, but something called the, the Joint Competence Initiative, which is a, uh, following the, the Grenfell uh, fallout and the Building Safety Act and, and Judith Hackett's uh, report into to building safety. Um, this started with a group of Tier 1 main contractors getting together to, to consider how they might um, assess competence of their subcontractors. It's since grown, and now lots of people are in, involved in that, uh, in that process. So, you know, that's, it's a, I guess that leaves a, a, yep, a, question, a question for you. you know, how, how do you demonstrate that you are competent suppliers and manufacturers? Now, how do you communicate that to your clients? What information do you make available to them? I think there generally needs to be more openness and transparency here. Now, personally, I get really frustrated when you know, all the information I want on a product isn't readily available or you know, you're only provided with a with summary that doesn't, you know, doesn't tell you everything. Um, and that, I think, is a, a particular concern you know, going back to, to fire. Um, there is a real need to, to fully understand what has been tested, how it's been tested, and crucially, what the, the limitations of that testing are. And you, you really need to see the full reports in order to, to be able to make those judgments. Some manufacturers are a lot better than, than others in sharing this information, but it is really important, and I now urge all of you to, to be open and, and transparent with test data that you have. It, 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 it's important now. It will become now even more important in the future. Um, here's another example of, uh, of an activity we're currently undertaking in order to, to raise awareness about a particular issue, in this case related to health and safety. Um, and this is a, a current focus of, our, of, of my board. And again, it's a bit of a, a different approach to, uh, to our normal guidance. So here we are um, deliberately not being prescriptive or exhaustive. Now, we're not designers. Now, we can't tell people how to make their specific projects safe. But we can point out some of the issues that they should be considering and, where possible, point to, to other sources of information. So it's really important to, to get information out there and communicate that to people the best we can. We can't make people take, take this into account, but we can talk about it, we can communicate it and, uh, and try and encourage everybody to, to do so. I've mentioned uh, collaboration a few times this morning, and here are a, a, a few further examples of this. We, we helped establish the Society of Facade Engineering, um, and I'm, I'm currently a board member, and I chair their fire committee. Um, the SFE, again, is, is for uh, individual membership, and again, it's about promoting um, quality and, and, and competence for facade professionals. So, you know, if anybody is interested, no, please talk to me. Have a look at the website and, and join if you are if you're interested and, and able. We were involved in, in setting up the European Facade Network, which brings together universities across uh, Europe who have an interest in uh, facade engineering, teaching and research. Through this uh, network, we've been involved in a, a number of research projects, looking at things like glass and uh, adaptive facades, for example. Through the, the EFN... We also um, started the Journal of Facade Design and Engineering. This is an open source publication, which means people don't have to pay for it. Um, so there's good, good access and availability. Um, and all past issues are available on the website. So please take a look at that journal. If you have interesting projects uh, and products, consider submitting an article. Share it with others and get them excited as well. I'm being hurried up, so let's go quickly. Um, engagement and sharing is really important. Um, now sometimes that can be a bit of a struggle, but we, we have to persevere. So again, making people aware of issues uh, and aware of guidance is, is key. But I think crucially also that engagement needs to be both ways. Now it's important for us to engage with industry to understand the different challenges that, that you are facing and, and help and provide support where we can. And it, it's fantastic to see so many people uh, here today 
Now, these sorts of events are really important. Um, having everyone in a room together, sharing information, building relationships and so on, it's so important. You can't replicate this on Teams or, or Zoom. It's, uh, so it's, yeah, it's great that we are finally all together. Nearly finished. And finally, just for you, um, and specifically in terms of GRC, you know, what issues do you have? Now, what mistakes are, are commonly made with, with architectural GRC? I'd like to think there are never problems, um, but I suspect that might be a little optimistic. So you know, what, what guidance is needed? And, and I, I suppose crucially, who does that guidance need to get to? Is it to architects and those involved in specification, or is it contractors, for example? We've seen a, a, an increase in the use of GRC cladding in, in recent years, and I, I suspect that will continue. And uh, no, we are keen to, to engage and, and help with guidance uh, if, if required. And, and that's me done. So whilst I haven't spoken much about GRC, and I apologise for that, uh, hopefully you, you, know, you recognise the, the shared industry challenges that, uh, that I've discussed, and hopefully would agree that you know, CWCT has done much to, to meet those challenges. Of course, there remains much to do. Um, and we will keep responding uh, as the industry changes and develops. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.